Good morning. Hello there, YouTube. Devin here again. It is a little after 5 o'clock in the morning here. I've already had my breakfast, done my exercise, all the other good stuff. And before I head out to work and then up to Roy's to do some Mosin stuff, we're going to talk about a helmet. Um, this is the helmet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the General Service Combat Helmet Mark 7. Uh, it came out as an urgent matter uh, to replace the terrible performance of the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A Ballistic Nylon Helmets, which I have a video on uh, already in the Helmets playlist if you care to learn the history of those. Uh, now this is kind of a strange helmet because it was never supposed to exist and then it only existed for a short time before being replaced because this is what's called a stopgap. Um, this helmet, a lot like the Mark 6A, was designed to be a stopgap helmet <clears throat> until something better could be designed or adopted to protect the British soldier. So, this helmet was designed by NP Aerospace, the same company that designed the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A, um, uh, and was adopted in around 2009 to replace the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A, which, perform, which were performing quite poorly in the global war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is basically an off-the-shelf type design. Uh, this helmet was already in use, the shell was to a degree, um, in the form of like NATO traffic controller t uh, helmets and stuff like that. So there's shells of this helmet that are much, much older. Um, but the, the Mark VII infantry helmet, basically, combat helmet, is uh, something that was an off-the-shelf uh, design, and it is made from Kevlar. A lot of people seem to think, and there's a lot of rumors thinking that the Mark VII, like the Mark VI and the Mark VI-A, is made out of ballistic nylon. It is not made out of ballistic nylon, it is made out of Kevlar. Um, it's an off-the-shelf design. Um, ballistic nylon had been kind of pushed to the wayside and realized that it is a pretty terrible material for body armor a long time ago. Um, so... This design is actually made out of Kevlar. It's quite thin. It has a very good resin compound in it, and uh, it works quite well for performance. And in traditional British fashion, it's a pretty hideous looking helmet, and it um, seems to uh, be incredibly comfortable. It has that weird kind of leather pad suspension system. Still has the little horns on it, as I'll show you when we take the cover off, when we look at the liner and all that other good stuff. So, uh, and all that other good jazz. Uh, but this helmet served from uh, about 2009 until fairly recently when it was replaced by the revision Battleskin Cobra, which the British now know as the Virtus helmet, um, which is an American design of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene fiber combat helmet, which is the next generation after Kevlar. Um, it is a very, very good performing helmet, basically designed to defeat rifle threats. Um, Whereas this is still only rated 3A for like pistol caliber threats, but this helmet is a lot lighter. Uh, this helmet offers a really, really good amount of coverage, um, and it is incredibly light for, for what it is. Um, now, the British use this weird kind of color coding system uh, when it comes to their helmets. So the Mark 6s are all green, and the Mark 6As are all black, and the Mark 7s are all tan, uh, because they wanted them to not only be very easy, easily distinguishable, um, to not confuse soldiers who are genuinely pretty dumb, um, and, uh, to help with supply, it makes it, makes everything real easy when you're color-coded that, and it was being primarily used in a desert environment. So, uh, it's a kind of neat, weird little helmet design. Um, the liner on it is basically a drop-in copy of the Mark 6A. It's literally the same exact liner as the Mark 6A. The chin strap did change. It got a little bit more complicated to help disperse weight a little bit more because the Mark 7 is a little bit wider uh, than the Mark 6A in order to accommodate modern uh, communications uh, and stuff like that, which I'll show you uh, how that would all work and stuff like that when we flip the camera around here and take a look at the liner, which we will do right now. Stay tuned for that. Alrighty, so here we have the Mark 7 helmet. As you can see, this one is basically unissued. It's it's brand new. I bought it brand new. Um, so compared to the other, uh, the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A, you can see it still has the rubber horns because it has the same exact liner as the Mark, uh, the Mark 6A. Um, but you can see that it has some extra screws around the outside. It has um, screw here um so it has like five screws around the outside no screws in the front no like nods attachment or anything like that the british use like a ratchet strap system for the mark 7 but all of these five screws only purpose is to hold in the the chin strap 
Um, it's kind of a complicated design, as I'll, I'll, I'll show you here. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we've went away from the Mark 6A style and Mark 6 chin strap. We now have two uh, straps. Um, and this serves uh, some purposes. Uh, for one, it uh, the two snaps are going to help you, uh, for one, with security when you're out in the field um, like that, because the one snap was prone to coming undone when the snaps would wear out. Um, but it also has another purpose, where you can uh, adjust it uh, all the way down. Um, you could adjust it to be a, a little bit uh, lower, like this, for wearing with a gas mask. Um, so you don't need to uh, take your helmet off and adjust it in like a chemical threat. You can just move one snap over um, and you get an extra couple inches in the chin strap for accommodating a, a gas mask. Um, so now this chin strap isn't quite really um, standard. It does have a quick detach buckle on it, which is a little bit different um, than the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A, as you can see here. Just a normal kind of buckle that you would find on a lot of helmets. Um, I also have the Comfort Upgrade Pads uh, in this in this helmet, which you can see here on the, the back of the chin straps to keep them from rubbing on the back of your neck and your bald head. They have these kind of foam pads. And then they also have these big kind of ear pads uh, right here on the side, which are normally not issued with the helmet. It's just a squishy kind of foam pad. There's not really anything in it um, other than that. It does have just a piece of loop Velcro on the back and you get a big hook disc basically like you would get in an ECH, uh, ECH or ACH uh, to put into your helmet like that. And what that does is because this helmet is so wide, um, it, it wasn't very stable laterally. So side to side, the helmet tended to rock. And that's a very thing that happened with both the Mark VI and the Mark VI A as well. Uh, these kits will go into the Mark VI uh, and the Mark VI A as well. And in addition to that, um, so there's also a foam pad underneath the kind of side of the the liner here, um, which a lot of times they weren't used. Um, even though they are more comfortable, they tended to block uh, flow of heat through the the helmet, uh, which kind of sucked. I've also seen them put in horizontally, um, so they still leave a channel that goes from side to side. Um, so then you could take these two pads out and use communications. Because like I said, these, these pads would not have been... Uh, would not have been issued with the uh, helmet, uh, so to speak. Um, so uh, there are just extra upgrade kits to improve the stability and comfort of the helmet. Other than that, uh, the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A, um, the chin strap is still a little bit more complicated. Um, it does have some extra little support struts here, again, to try to uh, solve that lateral stability issue. That's why part of the chin strap comes all the way out to the sides of the helmet here, to solve the lateral stability. Uh, this is the widest British helmet. Now, all my Mark 6, my Mark 6A, and my Mark 7 are all size medium, and this is the widest one. So it's going to be the least laterally stable because of how wide it is. Um, but other than that, it's exactly the same as a Mark 6A liner. Um, the only change is the chin strap. It even still has the same little herringbone nylon adjustment strap to adjust the to, um, the tightness of the, the liner. And uh, the chin strap just got a lot more complicated, but it's the same material and all that other good stuff. It adjusts the same way. It replaces the same way. You can't really replace the liner in these without cutting the, uh, the little horns off of it. And finding the new horns to drop in a new liner is pretty hard to do. Um, so I wouldn't recommend cutting the liner out of these, um, which is kind of weird. As you can see, this helmet's been issued um, at one point because the name, the guy's name is covered over by a disc uh, and a bunch of other crap like that because I got it basically an issue. This helmet was issued, but basically not used. It's brand new um, and all that other good stuff. Doesn't stink or anything, not even dirty at all. Uh, so... But that's what the liner of the Mark, uh, the Mark 7 looks like. I'd show you the Mark 6A helmet liner, but it looks exactly the same as this other than the chin strap. So there really wasn't a point, I thought. Um, and there is a comparison in the, the other videos. Um, but the Mark 7 did replace the uh, Mark 6A in frontline service. The Mark 6A and the Mark 6 were still actually in service at the time this thing was being issued um, for quite a long time. And the whole series... Um, was is hopefully going to be replaced by the Virtus. I'm not sure if it is yet, but that was the goal anyways at the time of this video. Um, I know that the British government wanted to replace the whole military uh, headgear with the Virtus. Um, so we'll flip the uh, video back here around and take a look at the helmet being worn, how it fits, 
uh, and everything like that, and then uh, we will conclude the video. Alrighty, so here we are back at the Inverted Helm video. I did take the stability pads out of it, um, so that way we can see how it fits with with both. Um, so we'll put it on here now, and I obviously uh, put the cover back on it. As you can see, this helmet is large. It's quite bulbous, um, but we're going to try it without the stability pads. Immediately, it feels like it's only touching the front and back and very top of my head. And if I rock around, you can see that this helmet has a ton of play in it uh, horizontally. This is so easily moved like this, and that sucks. That's uncomfortable. Um, I don't like that at all, and I'm sure my hair's absolutely screwed right now. But, uh, oh no, not so bad. Um, but the uh, comfort pads uh, help with that a lot. So I'm going to put those back in now, and then we're going to put the helmet on and see see the comparison there. So now you can see the comfort pads are, are reinstalled there on the side and uh, we will put the helmet back on and check out the stability now. So now if I rock my head around you can see that this thing is you know it is a lot more stable now because of that so it's a it's an upgrade i recommend for all the british helmets like i said you could do it through the mark 6 VI, mark 6a and mark 7 um i think these kits are still out there these little uh comfort pad upgrade kits for the um british series of helmets they are incredibly incredibly good um i like them a lot obviously so now we're going to obviously show you the profile of the helmet so here's how it would look being worn from the front okay um from the from the right side, as you can see, this helmet is kind of a unique shape. It has a very deep kind of skirt, um, but the helmet does genuinely sit relatively high on the head. It doesn't obstruct your hearing too much. It doesn't obstruct your vision, uh, really. It's a, it's a really good design. It's a comfortable helmet to wear, um, and it's very light. I don't think people realize how light these helmets are. So here's what it looks like from the rear. As you can see, the kind of weird, complicated chin strap, and it's like huge series of whatever straps that go every direction and then uh, simulating going prone I'm gonna look up as high as I can now and we're gonna see if the chin strap bites or if the shell bites uh, and stuff like that the hoodie kind of simulates like collared body armor and stuff which is still fairly common um, so if you see the helmet touch my hoodie it's obviously you know going to touch body armor uh, if you were wearing it so that's a factor to consider as well so if I look up here First thing I realize is um, the helmet is, is pretty stable. That leather pad on the front uh, seems to, to keep the helmet from, from rising, you know, and obstructing your vision and stuff like that. It does a pretty good job not obstructing your vision. Um, there's no bite at all because uh, the chin strap nape is obviously so high. Uh, bite normally happens around here, and since it's up here, that, that doesn't really happen. And the skirt, although it's low, um, it does touch the hoodie just barely, so it's probably fa fairly decent with body armor. I know that was a problem with the Mark VI and the Mark VI-A. They were very hard to use with body armor. Uh, this is obviously the left-hand side um, profile of the helmet, which is the opposite of the right-hand side. Um, but I know that the, the Mark VI and the Mark VI-A had problems with uh, the collars on body armor and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's just a, a bit of an issue. This doesn't seem to have that problem. Um, I like how much lighter these things are, and uh, they're, they're super comfortable. The thing is about British helmets, they're all hideous. Uh, the British like composite helmets, they're all disgustingly hideous, up until the Virtus. Um, but God, are they comfortable. The Mark VI, the Mark VI-A, and the Mark VII are all incredibly comfortable helmets to wear. And uh, I absolutely love them. They're a weird, cool piece of history, uh, and all that other cool jazz. If you don't own one, I highly recommend you get one, although that's next to impossible now, uh, outside of the UK because they're being destroyed or sold to other governments and countries such as Ukraine. This is a very popular combat helmet for Ukrainian forces right now. Um, there's a lot of them in Ukraine, which is probably contributing to the fact that the British aren't selling them or wanting to surplus them or anything like that because they don't want uh, obviously Russia and other countries to think that those are British soldiers in the field because basically the Ukrainians are you know rebels and stuff like that just bought surplus uh, so they're wearing a lot of other countries gear and they just don't want to 
seem like they're aiding the Ukrainians and stuff like that. So, uh, and whatnot. So that's, they're, they're getting really hard to find because they're being destroyed and stuff. So, um, but hopefully you like this video and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. Uh, this is a really, really interesting helmet. Uh, if you are interested in purchasing one of these, uh, I do have two of them. I do have two Mark 7s, um, basically in unissued condition like this, and I will pretty happily sell one. Um, it's not going to be cheap, um, but it's already here in North America, uh, so it's not going to do any ITAR law problems if I'm shipping it to somebody in North America who really wants one. And it is unissued, they're both size medium, um, but the size medium is kind of like how a lot of countries do their size medium, where about 80% of soldiers are going to fit into a size medium, so as long as you have a head that's below size like um, 59, 59 and below, a medium will pretty much fit you. Um, you could probably squeeze a 60 in there, depending on how your head is shaped. Uh, if it interests you, by all means, get a hold of me in the comments and we could try to try to work something out if that's something you're interested in. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's not going to be cheap. They're, they're pretty expensive and hard to find in bad condition here in the United States, let alone with uh, unissued condition, pretty much. So, thank you all for watching. Hopefully you like, comment, subscribe, all that other good stuff. It really helps me in the algorithms. The algorithms since the beginning of 2021 have been really, really hard on me. Uh, I have lost a lot of uh, views, audience retention, and of course money. YouTube basically cut my revenue in half. Uh, which really, really sucks um, because I, I relied on that uh, when it was pretty good towards the end of 2020 to, to help the channel a lot, and now I'm basically making nothing. Um, but if you do want to support the channel monetarily, um, that's the best way to do it, is you can, um, without actually paying anything, is to just like, comment, subscribe, watch the videos entirely, um, all that other good stuff. That helps, that helps me in the algorithms. Um, or if you want to support the channel, which I hope you do, I will leave a link to the Patreon in the description. All that stuff goes back to the channel, really goes a long ways to help, and you get access to the Discord if you're a Patreon supporter, uh, which I refer to as the cult, and there's a lot of really cool people in there, and I learn a lot of stuff from them. It's also the best way to get a hold of me, and if I'm going to sell anything, people get first dibs on the uh, stuff if you're part of the Discord. So. Thank you all for stopping by. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I will see all of you in the next video. Bye-bye now.